a member of the Board of Directors of the BIS. He is the current chair of the BIS Audit Committee and former chair of the Consultative Council of the Americas. As he moves towards the end of his term, it is certainly not an easy time in the world of global macro and financial markets. However, he also moves into the end of his term with recognition that fears over household debt and the housing market that were prevalent in 2013 have not materialized. Having introduced a much deeper focus on getting the pulse of Canada through the expectations of consumers, corporates, and lenders directly. In addition, it is very notable that the Canadian dollar has gone through a significant period of stability. It may be frustrating to those of us who watch currencies, but certainly a gift to the Canadian corporates. And also, having led the bank and Canada through what has been a notably complicated time in the energy sector. And with a bold move yesterday to support the economy during a time of uncertainty. All with a communication style that has allowed the average Canadian to gain a new appreciation for literary devices that are used to simplify, simplify very complex policy decisions. And with that, I would like to welcome the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Governor Polas, to the stage. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's uh, great to see everybody here today. Thank you so much for being out here today. Special thanks to uh, three of my board members who are here today, Clark Kennedy, Deborah Bilecki, and Stephanie Bowman. So it's like, a, like they do my performance appraisal, right? So uh, I've got to be on my best uh, today. Well, I thank you very much for the invitation. It was perfectly timed as we were talking beforehand. Uh, who would have thought we would be uh, in the middle of what we're in the middle of today? It's particularly fortunate that I'm here just before International Women's Day, obviously to speak with women in capital markets, 25 years of impact. Uh, it's a group that strives to increase the participation of women in the finance industry. This is very important, and not just because you're promoting more equitable outcomes in the sector. It's important because we know that a more diverse and inclusive workforce leads to better decision-making and stronger economic growth. So the Bank of Canada actively shares those goals. So back in 2017, we established the Master's Scholarship Award for Women in Economics and Finance. And the aim, of course, is to attract and advance women in the core areas of our work. So those recipients receive a cash scholarship, they get a formal mentorship with a bank economist, and they get a job offer. And the seven most recent winners were announced just last month, along with winners of other bank scholarships, which are for Indigenous students and students with disabilities. So congratulations to everybody. So I'm here to explain our decision yesterday to cut interest rates by half a percentage point. <laughs> um, obviously, this, this speech was prepared kind of at the last minute. Well, not surprisingly, the threat to the global economy of COVID-19, the coronavirus, played a very central role in our deliberations. And we are coordinating actively with other G7 central banks and fiscal authorities. Sans surprise, la menace que représente le nouveau coronavirus, le COVID-19, for the economy mondial, a joué un rôle central dans nos deliberations. De fait, nous coordonnons étroitement nos efforts avec ceux des banques centrales et des autorités budgétaires des autres pays du G7. Now, people are rightfully concerned about the situation, given the human toll the virus is taking, and of course the tragic consequences for those affected. At this stage, the disease is only partly understood. Now, we will count on our public health authorities to give us good advice and to contain the situation in due course. The bank's job, the bank's job is to think about how COVID-19 may affect the economy. 
Now, it's already disrupted the Chinese economy significantly. And this is having ripple effects everywhere because Chinese producers are highly integrated with the rest of the world through supply chains. As the virus spreads, that disruption may be repeated in many other countries. Of course, travel plans are being canceled with obvious implications for consumer spending and travel-related business. But there may be more persistent economic effects through eroding consumer and business confidence. Indeed, Canadian companies, many of whom had already been forced to the sidelines by uncertainty over the future of NAFTA and the U.S.-China trade war, could retrench further. Now, the Canadian economy has demonstrated good resilience in the past couple of years. And that resilience could be seriously tested by COVID-19. However, depending on the severity and the duration of its effects. So before I discuss yesterday's interest rate decision in detail, I want to spend a few minutes on the foundation of that resilience, and that is Canada's strong labor market. Now, the basic story of the Canadian labor market is similar to that of a number of other major economies. Even though unemployment is low, there's a sense of unease among many people. Some are worried about being displaced by technology or by foreign competition. Others are concerned about finding stable work in the gig economy. But still, the numbers clearly show that the Canadian labor market is in good health overall. Last year, nearly 300,000 jobs were created in Canada. Now, the unemployment rate was below 6% throughout the year, near its lowest in more than 40 years. And meanwhile, wage growth has been increasing from around 2% to close to 3%. And importantly, the quality of jobs is also improving. Now, there are a number of ways to look at job quality. But one of them is job gains have been concentrated in full-time work. Another is that the share of people working part-time involuntarily has shrunk to near the lowest in more than a decade. Now, the bank is going to publish a comprehensive staff analytical note in the, in the coming weeks that looks at a wider range of indicators of earnings, job security, work-life balance. And it shows clearly that job quality has improved in Canada over the past five years. Now, another sign of labor market health is that many people are changing jobs to get a better match with their skills and experience. That's a process economists call churn. And nationwide, churn is now at levels last seen more than a decade ago, before the financial crisis. The latest available data show that Canadians who change jobs are seeing their wages rise by 12 to 14 percent. So there's little doubt that this job switching is also raising productivity in the economy. And the latest data just received this week do indeed show a rising trend and productivity. There's more. It's taking less time on average for unemployed people to find jobs. And there are more than half a million job vacancies in the economy. Now this meshes with what I hear from business leaders across the country who say that their biggest challenge is finding qualified people to fill existing vacancies. Now of course, these are all national statistics. And they mask some pretty stark regional differences. We are well aware of the difficulties facing oil producing regions, for example. The 50% plunge in oil prices back in late 2014 contributed to a similar drop in investment spending in that sector. And combined with ongoing transportation constraints, this boosted Alberta's unemployment rate. At the time, it was around 4.5% before the oil shock and went to over 9% by late 2016, with young men facing the highest unemployment. Now, the latest jobless rate in Alberta is 7.3%. So this tells you that while the economy is adjusting, it remains a long and difficult process. On the other side of the coin, labor markets have been quite tight outside of the prairies, according to our Business Outlook survey. 
Two of the provinces with the strongest economies, BC and Quebec, also feature the highest number of job vacancies. Another key measure of labor market health is the participation rate. That's the percentage of working age people who are either employed or actively looking for work. So a rising participation rate signals that people who dropped out of the labor force at an earlier point are returning. This is very good for their own prospects and of course for the country's economic potential. Participation rates fell sharply in the wake of the global financial crisis and that slow recovery that followed. So at the time, a major preoccupation for the bank was the possibility that people would be unemployed for so long that their skills would become less valuable. That's a process economists call labor market scarring. But fortunately, labor force participation rates have risen in all age groups. And this makes the record low unemployment rates that we're seeing doubly impressive, especially given the setbacks that we've had along the way, including that drop in oil prices. So this is not to argue that higher labor force participation is always a good thing for seniors, for example. It could mean uh, either that they're happily extending their working lives, or it may mean that they need to work longer because they're not fully prepared for retirement. But still, when you look at all these indicators, you can see the labor market has been, and it continues to be, a source of resilience for the Canadian economy. A solid, secure job is the primary basis for consumer confidence and household spending which is the primary engine of growth in any economy. Now that said, it's also plain to see that there's still work to do. Sectoral weakness in the Prairie Provinces and in Atlantic Canada remains a concern. On another front, Canada's population includes several groups that have been chronically underemployed, representing significant untapped economic potential. In particular, the female participation rate is still about eight percentage points less than the male participation rate. And the indigenous participation rate is well below that of the general population. Helping new immigrants enter the workforce is another potential growth area. You know, as our workforce ages, we're generating barely enough new workers to replace retiring baby boomers. So immigration is key to our future economic growth. If you look underneath this trend, unemployment rates for immigrants after five to ten years are about the same as for the general population. But in those first five years, the unemployment rate of new immigrants is higher than average. And it's probably due to barriers around education equivalency. Well, given the importance of labor market health to our economic resilience, it's natural to ask whether there are policies available to strengthen it further. For its part, the Bank of Canada's role is to continue with a monetary policy anchored on inflation control. By acting in a way that keeps inflation on target, we help to stabilize economic growth and we keep the economy near its potential. And this in turn means that the economy delivers the most jobs and the most income that it can without creating faster inflation. Take for example the experience of 2015. Now, we knew that the collapse of oil prices would lead to a large drop in income and investment for the entire economy, and that would in turn cause inflation to head below our targets. As a consequence, we cut interest rates immediately without waiting for the adverse effects to appear. Lower interest rates helped to bring inflation closer to target and help the economy as a whole to return more quickly to full capacity and full employment. Now, I know this adjustment process sounds very simple in the abstract. Behind that economic theory, we're talking about real people. For those who are directly involved, adjustment can be very difficult, even painful. And what is more, the situation that forces individuals to take on all the related risks. Just consider someone working in the energy sector who lost their job when oil prices collapsed even if they can find suitable work in another province. They may have a spouse who is reluctant to leave a good job, and children who are settled in their school and community. They may, may need to sell their house, which could be difficult if the local real estate market has slowed down. 
Houses in the new location may be more expensive or difficult to find. It's not easy to face all these risks and overcome these barriers. And that's why the adjustment process takes such a long time. Now, in 2015, these adjustments were facilitated by lower interest rates and a depreciation of the Canadian dollar. Obviously, more targeted labor market policies, they lie behind the banks, excuse me, behind the bank's purview. Still, it makes sense for policymakers to address impediments that make it hard for workers to be matched up with those half million job vacancies. There may be new ways of helping people to deal with the risks involved in relocation or overcome regional barriers to job matching. So for instance, there may be areas where we could make it easier for skilled workers and professionals to recertify themselves to qualify for a job in a different province. We may also be able to learn from international experience in terms of improving our educational training and retraining programs. Now, I mentioned earlier that despite low unemployment, people express a certain sense of dissatisfaction and unease about the future. Now, it's possible that the distribution of income is contributing to this. Total labour income as a share of the Canadian economy began to trend downward nearly 30 years ago. And it's remained in a lower range for the past 10 to 15 years. Opportunities for globalization of supply chains, the steady increase in automation technology, have no doubt reduced employee bargaining power, not to mention declining union membership. But bearing in mind that globalization and automation also generate economic growth that benefits everyone, it's clear that there's no simple solution to this. However, it is a useful metric to track when you're considering alternative policy ideas. So all that said, the Canadian labour market has certainly been important to the Canadian economy's resilience, and its strength has helped to support the growth in incomes and household consumption that we've seen. However, it's just one factor that the Governing Council looks at when we sit down to take our monetary policy decisions. So let me turn now to yesterday's announcement. I think it's very important that we put recent developments into proper context. Business investment has been falling short of our expectations in Canada for the past three years. Six months ago, we were seeing signs that the U.S.-China trade war <clears throat> was beginning to affect Canadian exports and investment even further. In October, we pointed to a Canada's two-track economy, where soft exports and investment were being offset by a recovering housing sector, a strong labour market, and solid consumer spending. But we were concerned that the effects of the trade war could eventually tilt the balance of risks against us. With the economy operating very close to its potential, with the unemployment rate close to its historic lows, and inflation on target, Governing Council judged in October that the risk that growth would slow was not great enough to warrant a cut in interest rates. Now, the main reason was that lower interest rates, well, it could reduce the downside risk to economic growth, but could at the same time increase financial vulnerabilities. And this could make it harder for us to achieve our inflation target at some point in the future. In January, the conditions had changed, but the reasoning behind our decision was similar. Consumer confidence declined in late 2019 but there seemed to be a reasonable chance that that would prove to be temporary. And further, there were signs that the global economy was bottoming out. There was a growing consensus that world economic growth would edge higher in 2020. Accordingly, we again acknowledged that there were downside risks to the Canadian economy. But with the labour market in a very solid situation, we felt the downside risk was not sufficient to warrant lower interest rates. Well. A lot has happened in the last six weeks. In particular, the global economy will, at the very least, be significantly disrupted by COVID-19 in the first half of the year. It's possible that the global economy will snap back quickly after health professionals have managed the situation. 
and conditions have returned to normal. However, the outbreak and its effects could be more persistent. Consumer and business confidence could be set back for a longer period of time, causing economic growth to slow more persistently. This could include longer-term layoffs, for example. At this point, we simply do not know. Of course, the coronavirus is not the only issue on the table. Just last week, we received the detailed economic report on the fourth quarter of last year from Statistics Canada. As expected, this report shows that the economy slowed significantly in late 2019. Some of this was due to special factors that we knew about, such as an early winter that had left some crops to rot in the fields, the CN strike, the shutdown of the GM plant in Oshawa, and so on. Still, economic growth in the fourth quarter was lower than 1%, even when you take out the effect of these special factors. And this is because some of the slowdown was more structural. Exports remain weak. Business investment declined. And the recovery in housing began to moderate. The one positive was consumer spending, which remained solid even while the savings rate actually went up further. Consumer confidence did rebound in January, as we had hoped. So in short, the solid labor market we discussed earlier is giving the economy a measure of resilience. But what about the start of 2020? I mean, in addition to the impact of COVID-19, there are other factors. The strike by Ontario teachers, unusual weather, and the rail blockades. Now, we can hope that all of these factors prove to be temporary. But it seems that we are headed for at least another quarter of very slow economic growth. Since it is already March, these factors could easily affect the second quarter. And there's a real risk that business and consumer confidence will erode further, creating a more persistent slowdown, especially given recent declines in stock markets. Furthermore, world prices of commodities have dropped by more than 10% overall, oil prices by close to 20% since the start of the year. Now, commodity prices are a very important channel for transmitting international shocks into the Canadian economy. With the oil producing regions of our economy already stressed, this shock can only deepen and prolong the adjustment process that I discussed earlier. And those effects go beyond oil. So these stresses will inevitably find their way from commodity producing regions into other parts of the country. And those who are affected directly spend less money on everything. So in light of all these developments, the Canadian outlook is clearly weaker now than it was in January. When the economy is operating close to its potential and inflation is on target, a risk management approach to monetary policy often recommends unchanged policy in the face of a small shock. However, risk management demands a prompt and sizable policy response to larger shocks to ensure that the economy remains well anchored. So Governing Council agreed that the downside risks to the economy today are more than sufficient to outweigh our continuing concern about financial vulnerabilities. Indeed, declining consumer confidence would naturally lead to reduced activity in the housing market. So in this context, lower interest rates will actually help to stabilize the housing market rather than contribute to froth. Further, we expect that the B20 mortgage lending guidelines will continue to improve the quality of the stock of mortgage debt. Now, many of the implications of COVID-19 clearly lie beyond the influence of monetary policy. And authorities in Canada and around the world are focused on addressing the situation. For its part, monetary policy can contribute by buffering their effects on consumer and business confidence, thereby helping the economy to bridge the situation. This contribution can be especially powerful when the shock is global and the response is coordinated. As the COVID-19 situation evolves, 
Governing Council stands ready to adjust monetary policy further, if required, to support economic growth and keep inflation on target. While markets continue to function well, the bank will continue to ensure that the Canadian financial system has sufficient liquidity. And we continue to closely monitor economic and financial conditions in close coordination with other G7 central banks and fiscal authorities. If you mind, I will summarize the final point uh, for the benefit of the national audience. Les perspectives de l'économie canadienne sont nettement plus faibles qu'elles ne l'étaient en janvier. À mesure que la situation de COVID-19 évolue, le Conseil de direction se tient prêt à ajuster de nouveau la politique monétaire au besoin pour soutenir la croissance économique et maintenir l'inflation à la cible. Bien que les marchés continuent de bien fonctionner, la Banque continuera de veiller à ce que le système financier canadien dispose de liquidités suffisantes. La Banque continue aussi de surveiller de près les conditions économiques et financières en coordination avec les autres banques centrales et les autorités budgétaires du G7. So thank you so much again for being here today. It's a great time to celebrate what your, what your organization is about. And I'm sorry that the news is so uh, downbeat. Uh, but we are, we are on the job and uh, working hard to smooth out this one as we have done in the past. Thank you so much. Thank you. That speech, you're talking about uh, the strength of the labor market, but also concerns about. Uh, well, it looks like he. I just want to see if he's going to be taking some. Okay. Yeah, he's going to be taking a few uh, questions. Let's a listen. Lot in your speech, but maybe if you could spend a few minutes just unpacking and speaking a little bit more about the monetary policy response and its impact in terms of the stability of housing versus adding froth to the housing market. Yeah, I think that is a really crucial point, and uh, of course, everybody's read the reports today that that's if you know people are are happy to see that we're taking this uh, situation seriously. But the side effects are of concern uh, to many around uh, financial vulnerabilities more generally, and of course, the housing market specifically. But as I said in my remarks, uh, that notion of trading off uh, between hitting your target exactly today and possibly creating vul more vulnerabilities in doing so. That's an argument that we raised back in October and again in January. And when you're in close enough to the zone, you know, that uh, you're kind of in uh, what I call the, the uncertainty zone, it's okay to ignore the small f shocks that come along and to say, well, okay, we're gonna kind of see through those things. But when something big like this comes along, it's important to show that prompt and decisive reaction and of course your primary goal which is price stability and the stabilization of the economy has to be uh, paramount. Uh, but the, the notion of what it does to financial vulnerabilities in particular to the housing market depends on what the shock is that we're dealing with. So if I were to say well uh, like exports are even weaker than we thought so let's cut interest rates. Well we'd be trying to promote stronger growth in housing to offset weakness in exports. Well, that would be putting extra fuel onto a housing market that's already quite robust. But the shock that we're analyzing today is one where we believe it'll have its profound effect on consumer confidence and pro probably also business confidence. So when con consumer confidence goes down, their willingness to make large, large expenditures goes down across the board. Okay, so, so you're going to see that effect work its way through the housing market. So in that case, lower interest rates are kind of working to buffer that effect in and of itself. In other words, to stabilize the housing market, not seek a, a, a new upswing in the housing market. It's to offset the downside that's coming through that uh, reduction in consumer confidence. So that's, that's the essence of that point. It depends on what shock is hitting you. Uh, what is the optimal response in a given situation? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I have many questions here that are on a similar theme, so I'll try to summarize a few of them. Usual policy, one dollar per question? Oh, well, we're about to be rich. Okay. We are in the midst of a supply shock and potentially a demand shock stemming from the coronavirus. What is the role of a central bank and what toolkit do they have beyond setting the overnight rate to respond? Okay, so this is, this is absolutely true. When, uh, when, a, when a virus disrupts the ability of the economy to produce goods or services, uh, as economists would say, well, that's a supply shock. Now, it doesn't necessarily have a demand shock associated with it. People might still want all the things they used to want. What we've argued here is that it becomes a demand shock when it has confidence effects or perhaps layoffs or lower commodity prices cause you know, less income to be available to make purchases and that causes the economy to slow down. And so our policies are directed at the second part of that. Uh, monetary policy can't uh, you know, somehow make supply, supply disturbances, can't correct them. Um, in terms of how the follow-up proceeds, uh, interest rates are, of course, a very blunt tool, and they'll, they'll, they'll help, for example, everybody renews their mortgage, or assuming, uh, assuming all the mortgage rates go down exactly as, as you know, by around 50 basis points, let's say. Uh, you know, that, that will make a meaningful difference uh, to people with variable rate mortgages or people renewing their mortgages, of course. And so that adds to the cash flow in the economy, and it, it buttresses things. So that's, that's, that's a positive uh, force that we've, uh, that we've put in place. Um, if, uh, if, if we have other tools in our toolkit, so if, for, for example, if there are credit, credit log jams or uh, credit shortages uh, in certain segments of the market, we have tools that we can draw upon to, to get more liquidity through the system and unplug those, those pipes. As I said right now, the system seems to be functioning uh, very well, as usual, uh, but we'll be watching all of those details along the way. Here's one for you that maybe will give you an opportunity to speak a little bit at how you wish we knew about the Bank of Canada. Um, but I quote, I love the decision to issue forward guidance. That said, what does the market still get wrong or misunderstand when it comes to the Bank of Canada? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I, I mean, I, I, I think forward guidance, formal guidance is, is in formal terms. I think it's... Uh, it's offering up even more details about what your future actions would be. And normally it would be uh, described as conditional on something, either conditional on time or conditional on some developments in the economy. It's a tricky tool, and so we've kind of stepped away from using forward guidance as a routine matter because we're not at the lower bound. It was especially helpful when we were at the lower bound, when interest rates were as low as they could go. Then you're using forward guidance to get a little more impact through through the yield curve. Well, I mean, I don't think the yield curve can get, well, I mean, I shouldn't make a statement about <laughs> where the yield curve can go, but let's just say I don't think there's not a real need to uh, squeeze more juice out of that lemon uh, at, at this stage. So what we offered yesterday was not intended to be forward guidance, but rather to let everybody know that we are in close contact uh, with our, our, our G7, brothers and sisters who are dealing with the same global shock. Uh, we all have a shared understanding of the impacts. Uh, we have a shared understanding of what tools we've got and when we would use them. And uh, so that's a very high level of coordination. Uh, you, you should be assured of that. Those, those lines are wide open and we're talking basically every day now. So that's, uh, I think, uh, something that people should take assurance from. It's not intended to be a forecast. Um, you know, we can all hope that, uh, you know, this, 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 this virus shock that works its way through um, is something that gets managed by our health professionals and that the fallout is less than we're prepared for. I think that that's something worth hoping for. Do you anticipate that the Bank of Canada would ever move into negative interest rate territory? Um, well, uh, that, uh, I'm not going to offer forward guidance of like that. <laughs> but let's just say that back in 2015, we uh, gave a speech here in Toronto uh, late in the year that year. Uh, or four, yeah, I don't know, that's 15, or maybe it was 14. Joe uh, will tell me later which I got, which it was. But anyway, uh, I, we we gave a speech to let people understand that we felt that negative interest rates uh, formed part of the toolkit 
that had been shown by other central banks to have extra effects beyond uh, zero. Uh, we've done the analysis as to what the actual lower bound might be. It has to do with the cost of hoarding cash and insuring uh, yourself if you're holding a lot of cash or storing it somehow. And so it's a lot of technicalities behind that. We consider it to be part of that broader toolkit. Uh, we've been fortunate in Canada that we haven't had to dig into that toolkit. Um, but it's all carefully researched and it's, it's available to us. But I consider that to be a very extreme measure. There's a lot of other tools in the toolkit that can be used, uh, you know, if we get interest rates getting close to the floor. But I remind you also that we're, you know, we're still actually quite a ways uh, from there. And, um, and if, if especially in a case like we're seeing now, a global shock with a coordinated response, there is a, I call it a coordination dividend that comes. Like the impact of that policy is, is bigger because it's, it's large and it's decisive and it's coordinated. You're not dealing with this by yourself. And so there's that sense of extra kick that comes. And as you can see how bond markets have responded. I think we've, we've, got, uh, we've got a lot uh, of stimulus flowing through the system to put a cushion under the economy as it deals with this. What about if, is 2% the right inflation target? Um, it's been our, the target of the Bank of Canada for some time. Um, there's often been discussions around whether or not a uh, target between 1% and 3% um, or whether it's an interesting time to think about uh, price level targeting. Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Wow. Did I mention, uh, did I mention this? I'm not trying to distract you for too long, <laughs> but you know that that is, of course, that was the the world, the best new banknote in the world. Seriously, we won the contest for the best new <laughs> banknote in the world last year. And uh, my first day on the job, when they get your signature, you know, they put your signature on the money, right? You have to sign these special pieces of paper. With a special pen, and I said, "When can we have a woman on the on the banknote?" Oh, not in your term, Governor. That we'd never be able to do that in just seven years. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so you you were asking some question about. Um, okay, so that's a really detailed question. But anyway, and there's a ton of research on that on our website because we're in the middle of the inflation target renewal process, lots of new research there. Uh, it's being led by Carolyn Wilkins, and uh, the website has a lot of, a lot of things that you can read, uh, both really hard one, things, technical things, and, and uh, you know, easier to digest things. So, but in a nutshell, we've, we've considered all those options over time. We, re, we reconsider them every time, every five years. This time, uh, Carolyn is leading us through, uh, let's say, uh, the, the most thorough horse race that we've done since back in the 80s when I was a researcher at the bank and we first chose inflation targets. So I was just a young researcher at the bank back then and we were doing all these different possibilities like you're mentioning, like what could we do instead of inflation targets. And we decided on inflation targets and we decided on 2% uh, because it was meant to be kind of the rate when inflation stops to be uh, of much interest to people. Uh, and yet not so low that it kind of gives you the, the possibility that prices might act, or wages might actually go down when, when, when th you know, if, if, they, if you have layoffs in your company and stuff, like you might give everybody a 0% increase. But that's a 2% real cut after inflation, right? So, you, you know, as a company, you're reducing your costs in a way, but you don't actually have to cut wages to get that to happen. If inflation was zero, you would have to. So those are the kinds of things that go into that analysis. And some of the things like price level targeting, that is about if inflation is below target for a time, then what happens is you, you work to get inflation back up to two, and then you let it slide a bit above two for a while. So the average ends up being two over a long term. So ours has been very, very close to two now on average for 25 years, uh, like within a couple of decimal points, a couple of tenths. So it's not really the issue that's going to make the difference here. Um, but uh, there may be different dynamic properties of the economy under different ways of characterizing this, and that's what the research is about. So I assure you we're high on, we're really on this issue, 
And over the course of this year, uh, we'll be making up our minds and, re and formulating a proposal uh, to the government for the next renewal. Uh, and uh, that's all very exciting work. You know, I'm glad to see your interest, and we'd happy to hear from you if you've got other ideas. Just just write us a note, and uh, you know, preferably under 10 pages long. Okay, but the uh, but the ideas, I'm, I can assure you, there's a, a breadth of ideas being considered at this stage. Globally, but also in Canada, mm -hmm. economic outcomes for women remain markedly worse than for men. Mm -hmm. How is this incorporated into the bank's frameworks or models or long-term thinking? So it, 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 in, a, in a way, it, it enters the discussion we just had about the, uh, the inflation target renewal. Uh, so one of the, one of the issues that's, that's come to the fore uh, in the last few years, was not actually considered before, is how different uh, ways of orienting monetary policy affect the distribution of income. And by that, I don't mean the distribution between what I talked about in the speech, which is between labor and capital or profits, rather the dis distribution across income levels. So some policies uh, are more likely to favor the top end of the income scale and others the lower end. So for example, when we work hard to get inflation on target, we're at the same time trying to get the economy back to full potential. When there's a downturn in the economy, who bears the cost? Okay. It's, it's, it's people with ordinary jobs that get laid off from whether it's manufacturing or, you know, the, the more vulnerable that, that, uh, that bear most of that cost of those layoffs. So some, some, uh, some uh, policy frameworks would, would aggressively move those things faster. And in that group, you would say, well, who are the most vulnerable? Well, you get down to those single income families who, you know, then, then we're going to say, well, disproportionately women. So that's an example of a, of a dimension in which women would figure prominently empirically in that analysis. So over time, would this policy work better for that group than another policy? And if it gave us roughly the same outcomes for the macro economy, then we'd choose the one that was better for those in income distribution reasons. So this is a, this is a very uh, complex argument to get into the models, and that's one of the things that uh, is being worked on now, which, as I said, was not part of the original research uh, from 30 years ago when, when I was doing it. Uh, so that's a major advance. That's just one aspect. I mean, other, otherwise, what we think of is primarily, as I mentioned in my speech, about the potential for the economy. We know that, you know, if you could raise female participation by three or four percentage points, get halfway up to where the male participation rate is, which is like eight percentage point difference. No, it adds a huge amount of income for the entire economy that's untapped. So looking at ways to make that easier, I think I've got a lot of, if you like, profit for the economy to, to do. So, uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged to see lots of things that are being thought about or, or under development that, that I think will point in that direction. What about when, um, when considering the future, um, what are some of the trends that you expect to see unfold in both the labor market, but also in terms of monetary policy globally? Oh, did I mention this? Uh, <laughs> um, no, okay. Well, you have a lot of questions there. It's a good group. Uh, gosh, um, but anyway. Uh, you know, I think I think uh, we are we are. The, it is an excellent question because it's clear that we we know that the world is moving to uh, has moved and will stay in an era where real interest rates, inflation adjusted interest rates, are likely to be lower on average than what we experience or what I experienced. So I shouldn't put you in my same age group, but anyway, what I experienced uh, in my uh, in my lifetime. And that's because of demographics in particular, and that, what that translates into. What people don't realize is that the past 50 years have been historically abnormal. I know that sounds weird because 50 years sounds like forever to many of you, and, and longer than forever for lots of you. But that 50 years is a demographic bulge since the post-World War II. That demographic bulge game went up and it raised potential economic growth rates and interest rates for 50 years. And then everything that happened were fluctuations around a much higher trend. And now that folks like me are gradually finding their way out of the workforce, 
Economic growth rates globally are slowing down to a much lower level, and interest rates similarly to a much lower level. That means we'll be fluctuating around levels that are much lower, and so by definition, central banks will have much less room to maneuver than they've historically had. And certainly if you compare today to 2008, well, that's, that's a pretty big difference. And so what that means is that monetary policy is moving into a whole different era where those constraints have to be acknowledged, not just theoretically, but you know, here we are, we're at one, and the constraint is there. And so um, what does that mean for, for monetary policy? Well, it could, could mean that monetary and fiscal policies are more likely to work in combination. And so for sure with a greater awareness, cross-awareness, used to think, uh, well, fiscal policy is done you know, once a year and it's more structural, and then if shocks come along, the monetary authority kind of takes care of them. But if, if, it's, if there's not enough room to maneuver to take care of them, then you need a more elastic kind of fiscal arrangement that supplements uh, monetary, uh, monetary tools. And so there is a lot of advanced thinking going into that. I couldn't possibly summarize it here today, but again, it's on that same place on the website. And, um, and the thing is, we do that entire effort in collaboration with our colleagues over at finance. So we kind of have this two-way thing as we work our way towards that inflation target renewal agreement. Um, so very exciting. I don't know where that's going to go, but it's, so I'll, be, I'll be watching it more like a hobbyist as opposed to a practitioner. Well, with that, Governor Polaz, we've come to the end of our Q&A. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure to host you today. Thank you very much for joining us in WCM and all of our supporters in the room. Um, we were really thrilled to host. To host. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.